Reef Boom is sponsored by Polo Reef, Champion Lighting and Supply, and Polyp Lab. In terms of phyto, what, yes. so my understanding is that there are different, would you say, species of uh, phytoplankton, different uh, types mm -hmm. of phytoplankton that can be uh, cultured yes. and raised. Um, what do you guys use for your um, systems and why are you using it? Okay, a great question. So um, Again, algae, specifically microalgae especially, um, is a term of convenience. So it's like, you know, even more, a red algae cell and a green algae cell are far more estranged from each other uh, than let's say a flatworm is from you and I. They are they're very, very, very distantly. So every single shape and color of algae has its own nutritional profile um, and everything. So when you're trying to select what you want for, let's say, the reef aquarium industry, yeah. you're going to want to establish a few criteria. One, um, it's going to want to survive in salt water because, you know, we can't be dosing. You know, there's no real way to isolate the algae from the water itself. So we don't want to be dosing, let's say, a bunch of fresh water. So things like chlorella, spirulina, these are out. These are freshwater algae. We want marine algae. Um, uh, secondly, is that we want them to be making things that we know are nutritionally good for the corals. So when you get any good food, mysis shrimp or, or any good flake, the first ingredient should be um, some form of marine protein, cuttlefish meal, soybean, I mean, uh, krill meal, salmon, whole salmon, something like that. And the point of that, that marine protein is because it has those golden fats. That's the really expensive part that people pay for. And because saltwater organisms live in salt water, they can't live without those fats. So we want every algae we grow to have those nice big fats. Um, so we want them to be able to live in salt water and then we want them to be good nutritionally. So for that reason, I've selected three microalgae species that are commonly applied to marine aquaculture. So these have been commonly used to grow and raise filter feeding organisms like oysters and scallops. Um, and they've also been used to feed very, very tiny larvae successfully, which need these things. Yeah. So we pick species that have lots of scientific literature behind them so that we know what we're dealing with. And then we have the NOAA lab to provide the stocks so that we know that we actually got what's in the paper. That part's so important because otherwise you're just growing a bunch of green water, mm. which could be not perfect, but it could also be bad because some algae like red tide produce toxins. Some algae like pest algae are really hard to digest. So they build up and make the tank look really ugly. Mm. Some algae uh, can actually change the water chemistry so they can uh, actually steal vitamins and other nutrients away from corals, make them in a less biologically available form for those things. So we want to be specific about what we're making. So for that reason, I've picked three species that are commonly used in aquaculture. The first is T. isochryses lutea. It's essentially like a little golden nugget. And its job is basically just to make those golden fats. And when the cultures get really dark and they kind of look like chocolate milk, um, that means that the T. isochryses has maybe six million of them in every milliliter, and that's crowded. Mm. And they're like, oh, man, it's crowded. We can't possibly grow anymore. <laughs> so they stockpile fats. They're like, oh, we're going to – some the calamity might come soon. There's too many of us. <laughs> so they have the ability just to stockpile all the fats. So their job is just to be like this big stockpile of fats. They're relatively defenseless. They can't swim very fast. You put them in the tank, corals, filter feeders, anything is going to be able to hit them pretty much immediately, get the fats in. Tetracelmus, very different. It's a green algae. Marine algae um, will survive in the tank, but it's a lot bigger and it's faster than T. isochryses. So it'll survive for a little longer in the aquarium. And when it gets scared, like when there's a lot of light, like way too much light for it, probably like what a reef tank is going to expose it to, it settles. Like makes like a little thin, not really like firm attached, but it just attaches to a substrate when it gets scared. And that makes it really available to snails and urchins and a lot of the other stuff that you probably want to be supporting and that might not get enough forage in a really well-aged, really nutrient-low uh, reef tank. 
So being able to supplement grazers and stuff like that, very important, tetracellinous. Um, but a lot of green algaes don't necessarily have good fats. Tetracellinous does. Some green algaes, uh, like nanochloropsis, have very, very thick indigestible cell walls. Tetracellinous really does not. Um, so tetracellinous is a nice way of being able to get the positive aspects of green water, quote unquote, um, while also getting some of the better benefits uh, from the T. isocrises. And they also make some cholesterols that the isocrises doesn't make that critters do need as well. Thirdly is rhodomonas. This is the one I know the least about, but I've, I've had wonderful time the last three years really digging my teeth into this one. <laughs> this is the one that is red and it's, it's the actual color itself, not just because red looks cool and love the contrast, but that red is phycoerythrin and other pigments which are essentially, you know, we know the green pigment that the algae use to gather sunlight, but the red itself, um, what pigments are is because they let cells photosynthesize, they absorb light, um, which is cool, but it also, what is that? It's a battery, right? Because you're taking energy and you're storing it. So when organisms eat these pigments, like when we eat a really, really red astaxanthin rich salmon filet, um, those pigments don't get broken down. We don't burn them for energy. They actually get fused into our own fat cells. So the pigments that that algae is making will continue to transcend, um, albeit it'll slowly get less concentrated over time, but it will enter the fat of any copepod or anything that eats that, and any fish that eats that copepod will get that color. And that's why we see some of the coolest colors in nature. Like when you catch a fish out of a really really good looking stream or river it's lit up with colors these are all the pigments mm. and all the algae that from that water that has slowly been incorporating into the fat of that animal so for rhodomonas we're trying to grow that pigment the pigment that is uh one uh shows all that vibrant color and could perhaps be the building block and uh enhance it in various organisms um and then two um, that battery because it stores energy, pigments, when they're stored, the reason we put them into the fat of organisms in general is because they're really good at uh, basically buffering digestion. When we, we, when we eat things, we get inflammation. Everyone knows that. You get bloat, you get like, Arr, especially when you eat like a pound of butter. <laughs> it's because there's inflammation, which is actually a specific term that means like electrons have been coming off of a reaction, like spare, like sparks in a fuse box. And eventually, if you get enough sparks going off, like something breaks. So if you have a bunch of batteries in the fat of the organisms, they absorb the sparks. Um, and the third thing pigments do when they're fused into the fat of organisms is because of that, again, capacity of energy, they allow oxygen to be trans transported. They can store and disperse oxygen. So when you see fish have like crazy colorations around their eyes or crazy colorations around any particular organ, that because... There's a myriad of potential reasons, but there is definitely enhanced oxygen transport occurring around those sites of intense coloration. So colors don't only look cool, they're functional. Um, so that's the part that I love because Rhodomonas gives us the potential to really dose and crank up that, 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 building, that building block of that, uh, that, that, that color. So you guys are culturing and dosing three types of phyto at TSS. Yes. So if, um, and this kind of um, goes to the question that uh, Andy Bauma has, which is uh, what is the role of phyto in an SPS system? My question um, is, is similar, I think, but um, if you had to pick one of those uh, phytoplankton to culture and dose in your home aquarium, if it was an SPS dominant system, which one would that be? Um, so my answer is twofold. Uh, one is that I've chosen those three species because they are relatively complementary in nutritional profile. So if possible, I would suggest a less, uh, cutting whatever dosage you were going to do of one and instead combine all three, um, because each one does kind of com complement each other nutritionally. The cholesterols found in the tetracelmus are not found in the exotrices. So that would be my, my, my nutritional answer. Um, when the question says to grow at home and dose in the aquarium. Right. If you can only grow one species, if you only have the equipment set up for one species of phyto. 100% I would rec recommend the green, the Tetrasomus chui. The green is infinitely more forgiving, both in terms of contamination, in terms of conditions that it will live at. Um, it will be very, very kind to a, a, a first time algae grower. Uh, once you get really confident with the green and if you want to try the others, you know, they have a lot of tricks and they can also kind of betray you last minute. Um, 
the green is very, very effective. And if you can get green going for a couple cultures in a row and, and transfer those, because you know every time you transfer a culture, it gets more and more uh, adapted to your conditions because all the old cells that didn't, that died, and the ones that succeeded had babies. Right. Um, so I would recommend green across the board. Uh, um, go ahead. And then uh, to translate that into how it would be useful specifically for an SPS, SPS systems, uh, to my knowledge, often kind of run the risk. If you're really on top of your nutrients, you can often bottom out, especially if you have very active colony growth. So being able to dose nutrients is an increasing trend. Um, but instead of dosing sodium nitrate, I would strongly encourage dosing a much smaller amount of, let's say, bioactive nutrients in the terms of algae. It's a way of bringing your nutrients up in a controlled way that's not just dissipating into the water, but actually being introduced through the context of all this different nutrition. And these algae cells are actually living up until the point that they're consumed. Um, so I think there's an additional benefit to that um, as a, a kind of a bioactive way of nutrient dosing. In addition, if you're trying to get rid of nutrients, when you have just dissolved nutrients in the water, your skimmer cannot just pick them up. Once they are packaged and enveloped, if you will, inside of a bacteria cell or an algae cell, they can be picked up by a skimmer. So if you crank your skimmer and you do very controlled phytodosing, you can provide conditions that the, the phyto and other plankton suck up the, the, the uncatchable nutrients and then allow your skimmer to suck them up and then you have a way of exporting that.